Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Getting Hammered. I'm your host, Mary Catherine Ham. I'm here with my co-host, Vic Mattis of the Washington Free Beacon. There's a ton going on in the news. We've got this Israeli hostage rescue we want to talk about, and then the insane, appalling reaction to the IDF rescuing hostages. A, a Hamas rally outside the White House, which we want to get to. And we do want to do some sports. We keep talking about Caitlin Clark and maybe getting to her, and then we forget. Sorry. See, this is the fate of women's sports all the time. I am. Um, this is my internalized misogyny, Vic, that I haven't gotten to this yet. But we will talk about the WNBA. Before we get to all that, though, uh, let's see what's going on with Vic. How you doing? Hello, Mary Catherine. Yes, I've been chopping at the bit to talk about Caitlin Clark for, since she was since she was in college, yeah. and now here she is now. No, I'm just kidding. Doing fine, a little bit harried. Was on my way out with my brown bag lunch, and then I went to grab an apple in the in the forgotten fridge bin. You ever go to the forgotten fridge bin, and then you find things that have been left there? Oh yeah. And it's a, it was a big surprise today, and and then I just couldn't leave it. I was like, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta clear everything out now. And I got stuck there, and then I was just in my own world. And suddenly, I was like, oh wait. I have the show to do in 15 minutes. So here I am. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's been pretty crazy. The weekend was nuts. We several things happened. One, Kate got a, a new car. And because my son is gonna get her old car. That's right. Uh, rather old, but he'll make it work. That's fine. That's just the way it is. It's so old, Kate's old Highlander, it has a tape deck. Oh, it does. Yes. But it doesn't actually work. So it's a teaser, oh, but it's so- Here it, I was gonna buy Michael some new kids on the block cassettes. Uh, uh, and KOTB, if yeah. you put the cassette in it, it'll eat it up. And I think that's the fate of most tape deck players, unfortunate cassette players. However, we get her a new car, it's a Subaru. So now we have two Subarus. So I feel like now we're like Martina Navratilova and Billie Jean King. Just I two love it. going out, love it. you know? But you then, mean turfs? Is yeah, that what you're yeah, saying? That was a little bit, yeah, that was a deep reference. Although I'm big on, I love Martina. But the uh, other thing is the whole process of just getting a car is so exhausting now, mm -hmm. you know, and they sort of wear you down. And I think about my mother, God bless her, was so good at negotiating. Like my father wouldn't say anything. And she would, you know, she would beat these salesmen down until they're basically losing money on the deal. You know, and now there's not so much of that haggling going on because you have the internet so you can compare prices. I mean, then they try to tease you with all these various warranty issues, you know, right. like, well, you never know. And it's like the deluxe warranty includes, you know, acid rain, the protection, that secret coating no, no, that no. they use. I love this. I love the clear coat, okay? Oh the clear my coat, goodness. You, you, you know what the clear coat is? It's like the simonizing. Coat, the clear coat is, is an admission that your paint job isn't good enough. Yes, okay? yes. That's what that is. That, that's what that's they're an saying. admission that you need better body guys. That's what that is. So yeah. I don't believe it. It's a scam. It is a total scam because they all they, they talk about, they used to talk about acid rain. Like it's still coming from Canada. You know, the acid rain comes down from Canada. And then they thought they talk about, well, you know, this area of Virginia, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, the construction, you get rocks and things, glass, you can get it, hit a nail, your tire can hit a nail. Yeah, you can, you know, you can get, go to the gas station and have it fixed for 15 bucks. Or you can do this mega warranty and birch. Three, just yeah. $3,000, you know? Yeah, just that's all. And the other thing was, of course, they, and how, you know, and, and, and things like bird droppings. Yes, like I'm going to go all the way out to the dealership because of, if my car that I'm buying now, cannot handle the bird dropping unless it's like, you know, the scene in High Anxiety where you're getting pelted constantly. Also, are you like, my dude, this is a Subaru? Right. I don't, it's, it's, you know. It's not, it's so not no, an Alfa Romeo. Like, no, 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 that's that right. <laughs> just, yeah, I, this is not, this is not my, you know, my, my convertible spider. So, but, but by the end of the day, and, and then, and then Mary Catherine, just you wait, just you wait when your kids go old. We just added my teenage, our teenage son, to our car insurance. Oh my goodness. Mm, yeah. The amount that it, sky, it skyrockets when you have a, now, yeah, Kate and I, we've been driving for years, knock on wood, you know, no issues. And, you know, and with her old car, you know, she was hardly paying anything and I was hardly paying anything. And suddenly it's turned upside down. And I feel like after this weekend, I just spent a million dollars. Yeah, so like. you did. Congratulations. <laughs> In a way, I did. We, we add our au pairs to our car insurance and they are oh. young, they are young, new drivers. And, so, and probably foreigners that adds a premium or no? Yes. So what 
we have all of them get uh, U.S. driver's license or mm -hmm. Virginia driver's licenses, which they can do in pretty short order. But they are young and newish drivers, so yeah. it just does cost more money. So, yeah, that's a it's funny that you mentioned that because I should mention I am on Ruthless this week. Hey. And we also talked about insurance Oof. for driving and how men really get the short end of the stick with their address aggressive driving. Yeah. And I joked on the show, like, which is crazy because women can't drive. I well, bet they yeah, loved it. I bet the, they loved the, the audience. Loved it. Yeah, somebody was waiting for me to say it. The actuaries don't lie, though. The actuaries don't lie. They're just, they're just dealing with data, Vic. And the young men are indeed more risky. Yeah, I think that's the you know the the, the highest the largest demographic for 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 those kind of car accident issues are the young men, and I think the second is old people. Yeah. Probably yeah. so. Yeah. I mean, we're in the middle, so we're fine. I mean, you, yeah. one upside about Joe Biden being president is that he does not drive himself. So that's He good. must save a lot on his progressive auto Jill, insurance. Dr. Jill is saving a ton. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's that's great. That's good. How are you, oh, Mary man. Catherine? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. You can listen to me on, on Ruthless this week. Uh, we were down at the lake this weekend, and we ended up somewhat by accident resurfacing a driveway by accident so, well do tell steve took on this project uh -huh. and steve is a real workhorse he's a go-getter okay okay however the product used to resurface this driveway was somewhat oversold the square footage of each bucket for resurfacing. Yeah. Now this is like a, it's like a sealant. It's like a black tarish sealant situation that you dump out of a five gallon bucket. I don't so, know the actual so, name So wait a minute. It. You're telling me that you did a resurfacing project and Steve was going to do it himself. Yes. He wasn't yeah. hiring like no, a, no, no. a company to do this. One man crew. One man crew. So <laughs> wow. you just like dump these buckets out on the yeah. driveway and then you have this big squeegee and you smooth everything out and you put it on the driveway. Before that, you like clean the driveway and, and blow the yeah, debris off. Yeah, you could power wash it. And sure. all that kind of stuff. Okay. So that part gets done. Again, the product oversold the square footage that would be covered. So Steve works very hard and realizes, oh, this is not going to take mm -hmm. the short amount of time that he had envisioned. So we did later become a three or four man crew with the older kids and myself jumping in. Now, if Child had, labor. If we had three or four of those squeegees, we would have been money, okay? Yeah. We could have done this in no time. But as it turned out, we just had the one. So we were doing different stations of people dumping tar over here and then, you know, smoothing it out on one hand, working in shifts. But we did get it done. And I got to say, even though, even though you work real hard in the sun for a day or two, it really looks nice. It really looks re like a, a dramatic difference and the actual work itself as far as diys go for anybody who's considering this as far as diys go very straightforward work it's not easy work but right. it's straightforward and it's satisfying as hell because you're just like it goes from gray to pitch black and beautiful and smooth so fast you're just raking out all those inconsistencies. You're making sure it's beautiful. I was touching up. I was OCD touching up everybody else's work, making sure. <laughs> this sounds so well. This is this is good to know. I'll, I'll let Kate know. Yeah, that's that she can do this. Yeah, she can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you got if you got small, I'll be, I'll be inside doing a yeah. brunoising an onion. Yes. If you got small square footage on your driveway, especially. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is yeah, yeah. doable. I actually, Steve was at Home Depot getting so much, so many of these buckets, in fact, that he was targeted by two people who asked him, oh, do you do driveways? <laughs> Wanting to hire him. Now. I would like, hire him. He looks like asked, he's very able. Well, no, yeah. they asked like, where's your crew? And he's like, I'm just doing it <laughs> by myself. And I was like, well, and with the, the small yeah. children. But he did. At that moment, he did look like a guy you would hire to do your driveway because he was wearing like camo shorts and a cut off Miller Lite tank top. Cut, yeah, in the, yeah, in the of Home course. Depot. Yeah, yeah, no, he was in his element. Yeah, I told I told the girls I was like, do some practice on this, ladies, and this would be a this could be a yeah. real uh, money maker for you. Like people people advertise mowing lawns. Psh, 
two young ladies advertising yeah. resurfacing driveways. That's that's what yeah. you do. No, it's like the car wash post. You know the you know the, the young ladies with the car wash signs. The, <laughs> the, it's, 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 the girls would be like. The girl just be like, people will be like, I don't know. Can I trust you to resurface my driveway? They'd be like, this is my dad. Right. And they'd be like, okay. Okay. Right. So, no, but I mean, there must be uh, an incredible amount of satisfaction knowing that you did not have to pay other people to do this work for you, too. Well, yeah. And it would have And cost you got a little money. bit of a workout. It was nice. Yeah. I did, I did get some arm workouts and back workout. Anyway, so that's what we did. We also enjoyed ourselves and I even, even got the, the toddler to successfully fly a kite for about three to five seconds. So I felt like I was quite accomplished this weekend. Do you, okay, so how did you, did you just say start running? Yeah, I told yeah. her to just start running and she'll take that cue, yeah. yeah. It uh, is, well, it's funny because there's a lot of dragging that could go on, mm -hmm. you know, when you're trying to get it, depending on the wind. I had a good wind situation, so well, I felt good. okay about it. And then her problem is that she, of course, wants to, she sees the shiny, beautiful, colorful kite, and she yeah. wants to be near it. So she runs toward the kite. And I'm like, no, 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 you need to no, run no. Oh, run the other direction. Yes, no, you got to, exactly. There's got to be that distance. I tried when I was a kid, I tried to make a, a kite fly by tying it to the back of my bike. Unsuccessful for many, many years. In fact, that never it never happened. Never happened. Never happened. You, know what? you have to go pretty fast, I think, on the bike to, to pull it off. Yeah, well, first you got to resurface your driveway so you can get a smooth takeoff. <laughs> yeah. I was going in circles. It wasn't working out for me. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. All right. Should we talk about the news? Oh, let's do it. All right. Well, there was wonderful, wonderful news this weekend. So wonderful that I actually had trouble believing it when I opened it on social media in the morning and was like, can this be, is this fake? Four of the hostages taken from the Nova Musical Festival on October 7th, who have been in Gaza for more than, I think, 250 or about 250 days, were rescued by the IDS in a dramatic daytime raid of a civilian filled area where they were kept in civilian apartments. That's Noah Argamani, who you guys will remember as the woman dramatically taken on a motorbike yep. across the border while she's famous photo reaching out to, to for someone to save her from this fate her mother has terminal brain cancer mm. and her wish was that she could be reunited with her daughter at some point she did indeed see her when she came back oh, good. but maybe not in a place where she can recognize her oh. at this point which is very sad oh. but her father you know embraced her all this uh, let me let me mention the other ones almog Meyer. Jan, Andre Kozlov, and Shlomi Ziv. Again, all taken from a music festival as they were yeah. enjoying the equivalent of a Coachella, a sort of EDM right. event taken brutally. And I just, I'm so surprised that they're alive, that they're medically sort of okay at the moment. I'm sure they've endured who knows what, but it was just such a miracle to see yeah. this. And as my friend Carol Markowitz notes, a lot of the attention will be on Noah, who is the young woman who was who was rescued because that video and picture are so iconic and people know them so well. Right. But these men, in no deal that would ever be cut, stood a chance of coming home. Right. They were young men, and young men have never been part of the conversation for being released by Hamas. Now, no one's really part of the conversation for being released by Hamas because they don't want to take a deal and they have had many, many laid at their yeah. feet that they refuse. But I think that's important to note. These guys weren't coming home unless they were rescued by force. That's right. just a fact. And uh, it's, you know, you said that, you know, this was wonderful news. And the first thing I thought of was, is it really the wonderful Mary Catherine? Because if you look at the reaction on the left and some in the mainstream, the, the spin seems to be more or less, was it worth it? Because there was a great collateral damage cost, obviously, to Palestinians and that is seems to be squarely the fault of the Israelis trying to rescue the hostages. And certainly not the fault of Hamas for, I don't know, taking the hostages in the first place and no, maybe is... using human shields. That doesn't seem to be a problem. The, in fact, the actor who otherwise I enjoy his work, so it, but it's ridiculous. He's ridiculous as Mark Ruffalo, the yeah. Incredible Hulk, as you know, I don't know if you saw his tweet and he was saying, you know, it's, it's great and all that the uh, four Israeli hostages were returned, but 
so many lives could have been saved if they just agreed to a ceasefire. Oh, and the oh. first the first thing is returned. They were returned by Hamas. They weren't returned, guys. They were rescued. Yeah. And the idea that it was because of, you know, not agreeing to the there had been other serious ceasefire offers put on the table that Hamas had turned down. And the bottom line is they do not want to give up these hostages unless they're getting in return a bunch of killers that are in prison mm -hmm. in order for them to do more harm and kill more Jews. I mean, this is, it seems very straightforward to, to me, but obviously it's very frustrating. And, and this sort of adds to this narrative of genocide when they talk about the numbers killed. Gaza Health Ministry initially was like 200. I think now they're saying 900. Meanwhile, the uh, the media is questioning the Israeli, you know, claims, as they say. Some of these hostages were taken from the homes of, I don't know, collaborators, journalists, somebody who might possibly work for Al Jazeera. We've done some reporting on this, and they are, many members of the media are resistant to giving any credence to that. No, it's wild. I think this this headline is sort of representative from CNN. Inside Israel's deadly operation to rescue four yeah. hostages. Again, First wasn't of all, worth it. The people, the people involved in this raid are real life superheroes with insane skills who undertake this kind of thing with an eye to reducing civilian casualties. They take on immense risk to go into an urban warfare setting, to go through doors that they have almost no idea what's behind, depending on the intel, which is, you know, shaky at best at times. They go into a place where, a theater of war where militants almost never wear any sort of uniform, where they yeah. purposely hide among civilians, where they put civilians they have taken hostage embedded with civilians mm -hmm. so that they can make it as hard as possible for Israel to do the work of rescuing yeah. its citizens. Thank you to those guys, one of whom passed away as a result of his injuries in a firefight while this was happening. They got to Noah first, completely unawares. They got her out. But as soon as that had happened, they go after the three men who are in a different apartment. They were near each other. And that signaled that something was happening and a, right. a firefight broke out. As usual, the Hamas numbers are not reliable. Yeah. Unfortunately, many press organizations just run with the Hamas numbers while requiring that the IDF do much more verification of its side of the story than they require of literal terrorists. And this has resulted in a reaction that is so upside down that I have trouble even understanding it. Yeah, well, you know, one of the hostages, a woman, says that she was turned into this sort of servant for her captors, and that's sort of dismissed. And the idea that, I don't know, if these were white supremacists who, who had captured, you know, kidnapped right. a, a black woman and, and made her into a slave, you know, would that be tolerated? Would that be news? I mean, it's outrageous. And, and, and you sent me this thing this morning about, I think it's from the free press, and the, this, this notion that, you know, these these people on the other side, when, it, when it's, you know, attacks against Jews from the right versus attacks from, against Jews right. from the left, it's, it's just a double standard. But we'll talk about that later with the, the incident at Lafayette Park. But no, the other thing that I was going to say was somebody else smarter than me was saying all this terribleness that has happened and all these innocent lives that are lost and, and the collateral damage, the Palestinians, for example, um, in this in this operation who who were killed in the process of rescuing these hostages, it poses a question of, well, if you, the people who, everyone who's upset about this can go back in time, was October 7 worth it? Would you still, because they're not going, right. they're now acknowledging, obviously it happened. They celebrated as a prison breakout. Would it be worth it? And, and I think they'd be, it's a real dilemma for them to answer that question. Because on the, you know, on the one hand, you know, they didn't want any of this to happen and look at Gaza now, it's complete rubble. It wasn't on October 6th. Right. But uh, on the other hand, um, they like to think of this as a prison breakout, that this was an ongoing struggle and a retaliation. So yes, it had to happen. At the same time, they don't think seem to think, well, what do you think they were going to do after you committed the worst atrocity against Jews since the Holocaust? So I mean, it's this, there are real problems with this.
No, it's it's actually shocking to see people reacting as if yeah. it's bad news that Israel liberated these four people, right? Yeah. What they're demanding, as usual, is that Israel follow every rule and, in fact, be right. more adherent to more rules than any other fighting force in the history of the world, while Hamas gets to do exactly whatever it wants. Right. And even then, what they what they want is like proportionate hostage rescue missions, right? So right. you can because you can you do can that. Only, yeah, yeah. No, the fact that they're using their own civilians as human shields, which, by the way, the Wall Street Journal reports a on correspondence from Gaza's we said Gaza's main dude, Yawa Sinwar, putting into writing that in fact his aim is to increase Palestinian casualties. By embedding with Palestinian yeah. civilians because he thinks that improves his situation on the world stage. And by the way, every single time Hamas has rejected yeah. a hostage and ceasefire deal slash offer, what has the American administration done? Moved closer to Hamas yes. and forced Israel to stop doing things. So he's actually correct. Yeah, no, it that, that's right, Mary Catherine. It's, it's not a bad bet for him. He knew how the world was going to react and a lot of countries who are going to side with, with Hamas on this. And case in point, the United States has now pushed for a ceasefire plan through the United Nations and supported, I think it was abstained, Russia abstained, but the rest of it, the, you know, the Security Council is pushing that, you know, this has got to end now before, before, you, before you kill more Hamas terrorists and rescue any more hostages, we got to put a stop to this. It is a bizarre position for this administration, this country to be in, the United States. Oof. Yeah. Um, speaking of the United States, shall we do the domestic reaction? Oh. You know, I've, this the, we were talking about a little bit about the press reaction and the international reaction, but let's talk about the domestic politics reaction and the protests in particular, which are framed in a very friendly way by the press, but look much less friendly when you look at the gatherings. So this is Washington Post says statues in Lafayette Square vandalized during Gaza ceasefire protest. New York Times protest against Gaza war draws thousands to the White House. CNN, why protesters outside the White House are carrying a two mile long red banner. Oh. OK, these these gatherings were violent. They ha are very obviously aligned with Hamas. Not it's not some sort of undertone. It's it's. The yeah. message they're wearing, many of them are wearing Hamas headbands. They are burning American flags, which is like sort of par for the course, but you know, not normies don't love it. They are chanting things about martyrdom. They are carrying signs about martyrdom in New York, outside the Nova music festival film that's being shown yes. in New York city on the front of the New York post is a picture of protesters carrying a banner that says long live October 7th. And the position of the left is that this is basically just a beautiful gathering of those expressing their free speech rights. It doesn't matter that the pelting things at park police and vandalizing statues, they're of the right cause, I guess, or the right, right oppressed group. And so we're supposed to have no condemnation for this, no issue with this, to the death to America chance, to the martyrdom aspirations. It's all just A-OK. -okay. It's wild, Vic. I, yeah, I think it's the, if you want to take a, a, a step back for a second, it's like the administration and the Democratic Party's way of trying, they're trying to have it both ways, right? Because they don't want to upset their left flank. And, it, you know, by, by, if they were January 6th, if they were MAGA insurrectionists doing exactly defacing, you yeah. know, the statues of Rochambeau and Lafayette, you know, the heroes of Yorktown, they would have fired tear gas canisters at them. I think they would have come out with batons and truncheons and 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 rightfully broken up, you know, this sort of you know aggressive behavior and vandalism. These activists were also limiting the movements of the Secret Service 
and that was okay. Our Adam Credo had reported, I think on Sunday, that, yep, yeah, as far as we know, they got back to us, the police and Secret Service. Nobody's getting charges thrown at them. They're not pressing any charges. So what happened was okay. Biden spokesman, Andrew Bates, said people have a right, a right, you know, to a uh, freedom of, of speech and assembly and to protest. They do not approve of the message, but they didn't say anything about the defacing of these statues of Lafayette Park. So apparently that's okay, at least for some people. But I was going to say, if you take that sort of step back, the Democratic uh, Party, the administration and those on the left, they wanted to have it both ways. They don't want to upset the left flank. And I think they're relying, obviously, on their friends in the media to not publicize these acts right. the way Fox does 24-7 so that they're not upsetting anybody in the center or independents who know would be upset about this. And oh, by the way, one I of the think pictures, they're right. I think it works. I think yeah, it works for them. Well, one of the pictures, too, which, again, you're right, will not be publicized unless you're yeah. going to look for it, is of a... An effigy of beheaded Joe Biden yeah. held aloft by, I believe, a man with a Hamas-specific headband yeah. they on can, I mean, Because these... they can do it. That's fine. It's cool. Make sure you vote. You know, you can still, as long as you vote for me, you can have a, my head, you know, on a, I mean, on look, a, on I, a spike. As, yeah. as is quite clear, like, I'm no, I'm no fan of big fan of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. But no, I, I do not think that's okay. I don't think right. it's good. I, now, it's not a crime to do that kind of thing. But like at some point, these folks like are edging into material support of terrorism. Yeah. <laughs> like at some of these organizations, oh, some, certainly. Of these, some of these messages yeah. like makes you go, what exactly is happening? Here? That's right. And uh, certainly yeah. for normal voters, you're, as you point out, if they saw this, Right. And saw that the left is sort of basically in favor of it. Right. Not not great. Because they 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 need their votes. These are people who would traditionally vote for them. I feel, Mary Catherine, that this should be like a slam dunk for Republicans yes. come the fall because I feel like all they have to do is cut an ad, you know, and simply show this. And Except ask, the people will be like, wait, where is is that Kabul? Where, right. That's not yeah, right. Where, where yeah, are these in folks? In Tehran. It's in Tehran. Surely that surely that's AI. The, <laughs> nope. Well, yeah. Yeah, they're making it up. The burning of, all you have to do, you know, show the burning of the American flag, death to America spelled with a KKK, right? Death threats mm -hmm. against Jews, the 10 encampments at our elite universities and say, have you had enough? You know, yeah. let alone other images of people running through the border or whatever. But I, I feel like it's a gimme, but I, I'm not so sure because again, it's very much downplayed elsewhere. But I do want to give props in addition to our Beacon reporters, Jessica Costescu and uh, Megan Blonder. They went down to the park. They reported on the scene, nice. and there, there was a there was a sign. There was a guy holding up a sign. And props to this guy, holding up a sign saying, "When's the Pride Parade in Gaza?" <laughs> and he was getting booed. He was getting booed. But again, it's baffling because a lot of these activists they have the rainbow flags and they support of course. Gaza because you know that's what they do in Gaza, I guess. They, it's should, they should they should make new lapel pins that are a rainbow flag. And and the Hezbollah flag next to each other. Yes. Right. That's a that's a good. That would be a, a good, good one. You know, like they have the Israel and America flags. Let's just do the other one. Right. Um, and it's just another stripe or color for the rainbow flag. Now that we've seen the new one that's hanging, you know, in front of NASA and at the Department right. of Education and other buildings here in town. You know, just just throw it all in. And like there there are a few people who see this clearly. For I saw Jake Tapper. We'll play a little clip of this. Is there much of a difference between? Killing Zionists and Jews will not replace us, which is what we heard from Charlottesville. It's all of a piece. I mean, it's, it's there. There's a rhetoric of elimination of Jews, of hatred of Jews that vilifies Jews and that use them as as dehumanized. And we have to remember there are two different visions of Palestinian politics. There's a vision embedded in the Palestinian Authority that has committed itself to peaceful coexistence with the Jewish people in one land. And then there's Hamas, which relies on the protocols of Elder of Zion in its, in, its, in its manifesto that in its original charter called for the genocide of Jews and that has practiced uh, terrorism throughout its history and in fact has destroyed every, every moment where the Palestinians have been close to making a permanent peaceful solution with the Jews in Israel. This is Charlottesville on yeah. steroids every day. Right. Right. No, people, some were so, argued, people were so upset and, 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 and by this, and understandably so, and the president's reaction to it, understandably so. Yes. This is happening. What is the president's reaction to it? And president's on another, well, he's on another planet.
So. When I saw some arguing like, well, there's been no deaths related to this. That's actually not true. I believe it was California where yeah. a, an older gentleman who was an Israel supporter was hit on the head with a megaphone yeah. and died from his injury. So that's not actually true that there have no been deaths, been no deaths related to this. It's all pretty creepy. Right. And there are moments in my political life when I look around and go, I was not, I was not expecting you guys to have this kind of reaction. And I don't I feel like you've really lost the plot on this one. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe we're not alone in this, Mary Catherine. I know that the latest approval ratings for Joe Biden are uh, his lowest yet at 37%. Oh, yeah. So, you know, 37 I mean, it's, not, it's, it's not, not really good, Vic. That's, yeah. For those of you who aren't political professionals, <laughs> that number is not good. Under 40 is not where you want to be. Yeah. And the disapproval is just like going gangbusters. Up and up and up. 57%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, On it's wild. On almost every issue, voters feel like they can trust Donald Trump more and by large margins when it comes yeah. to the economy, foreign, foreign policy, you know, the Middle East, you know, the economy, you name it, the, the, the border, they, they just tend to think that Trump would do a better job. Then. So, oh my goodness. That's a problem. Okay. It's, it's wild. It's wild. The reaction has been jarring, unsettling, did not enjoy. What are we talking about next, Vic? Well, I mean, we were talking about Joe Biden. He's going through some struggles and uh, one of which was there was a video that we have of him at a Juneteenth event at the White House oh. with Kamala mm-hmm. Harris and Doug Emhoff. Yes, and he yes. looks kind of, he looks kind of like he's in a different world that he doesn't know. I mean, this is his hand is just extended out to a, like in a handshake position, but there's nobody there, and he has this blank stare on his face. And I mean, our, our friend Chris Scalia says honestly, it's better than you know what basically Doug Emhoff was doing was just trying to get down. No, uh, I do kind think of look, this, there's a musical performance and he is surrounded by people with rhythm. And I do think that perhaps not exposing yourself to the kind of ridicule that would come from a feeble right. old white dude trying to clap along might have been one of the wiser decisions he's made in a while. Right. Unwittingly. I'm sure he didn't realize. I mean, he really looks I don't, it's, I hate to say this, too, because, again, our president. But he doesn't look like he, he, you know, there's this blank stare on it, on his face. But the other thing is, as you know, they're trying to, one of the demographics, they're, they're struggling across many demographics now, the Biden campaign. And one of them is actually young people who voted overwhelmingly for him in 2020 versus Donald Trump. And now Trump is ahead in some, or t- at the very least tied or ahead. That is a big, very big problem because even if they don't vote for Trump, it sounds like a lot of the young people are going to just stay at home. However, the good news, Mary Catherine, is they have hired the campaign. Oh, now, there's, you, yes. can't have any, you can't have any interaction, obviously, directly right. with these particular PACs. And this is, a, this is a particular PAC that has hired screenwriters from, I think, Saturday Night Live and Comedy Central and other places who are hip and cool and know how the kids talk. And they're going to put together various you know, social media posts on Instagram, TikTok, or wherever to show uh-huh. that, hey, this 81 going on 82-year-old, president, he's with it. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's going to work out? So thank you to the Free Beacon for reporting on this. This super PAC, look, I think all you you need to to know about these kind of folks is what the SNL political cold open looks like every week. I think their rate of success for being funny there is going to be much higher even than these attempts. Because I think when people try to go so raw, partisan, political, yeah. in their humor, you lose the part where you're humorous, yeah. right? Like, yeah. write good jokes, write them about, about both sides. But I think when your mission becomes first to elect a guy, it makes it harder to be actually funny. Right. And this mission obviously is partisan. It's also in behalf not of Barack Obama, who arguably was a little hip, Although those genes say otherwise, but you know. <laughs> the genes and the way he throws a baseball. Oh, as my somebody, gosh. As somebody who's thrown an opening pitch, I can tell you. you know, Although I so. should note that 2000, what, 2009 Obama genes and New Balances is the look for the young people now. So he's ahead he, of his time. He was was he time. just ahead of his time? Yeah. Okay. But no, I do not think this is going to be hip. I do not think it's going to be effective. I think they're going to get a lot of earned media out of a bunch of really cringed content. Yeah. 
the cringe is that's that's the operative word here, and they're going to really try to push it, make it just like making fetch happen, right? They want to yeah. make this happen, and, <laughs> and I'll be impressed if they somehow manage to do that. And they'll try to throw in all sorts of famous stars and celebrities. So it's like, oh well, I love this person, and this person loves Biden, therefore I'll vote for Biden. I don't know if that's going to work. I doubt it. I remember in 2000, Al Gore, when he was going up against George W. Bush, and everyone's trying to make Al Gore be cool and hip. Right. And it's great. Him and Tipper, when they were still married and the whole mm. deal and, and the kissing and they're in love with each other, they put together a movie. Oh, they got a, divorced, didn't they? They did, yeah. yeah. And they put together a, a, a movie, a short that I think ran during the Democratic convention. And it was like the mini bio of Al Gore at home with the family sitting around the table. And it looked like a normal family table. Like the, you know, in my mind, I know it's not, but in my mind, it was like the opening scene of credits for Roseanne. They're sitting around this right, right. table. Hey, everybody pass the mashed potatoes. And it was directed by the great Spike Jones. He's done many great movies, including Her right. and Three Kings. And so the documentary or this mini bio pick of Al Gore directed by Spike Jones is really good. And that still wasn't enough. No. So yeah. the PAC's goal here, ironically, is to have no cringe in its content. Yeah. They plan to spend up to $25 million. Which, look, even if you're doing sort of ineffective stuff, if you're spending $25 million and you're getting earned media out of it, which they're going to get, earned media is just whenever CNN or Fox or MSNBC picks up your right. advertising for a political candidate, writes a story about it, thereby behooving your candidacy without having to... to spend much more money. It aims to avoid splashy celebrity videos meant to go viral online and instead focus on 30 and 90 second influencer style ads and some highly produced and scripted ads. I don't know, man. I It's going to be, again, the press and people who make political ads have been far behind the public in realizing that Joe Biden is exactly what he looks like he is. Yeah. And I don't think any effort to paint that differently to Gen Z through a bunch of influencers is going to make that much difference. In fact, it might send you in the other direction because it accentuates how old and feeble he is. I'm beginning to think that your theory and our friend Hugh Hewitt's theory about the first debate happening before the Democratic nominating convention might have some substance to it, if you will, because if he's getting progressively worse, because there's nothing you can do. At this point, you can have the teleprompter, even with the teleprompter, he was having some issues more recently right. and try to surround him so you can't see his, you know, his gait, the way he's walking in those special shoes right. or the glazed look in his eyes uh, at that Juneteenth event. He's going to be in that debate. And even with Dana Bash and Jake Tapper, it's not Fox. So it should be, it's going to be not, a, I mean, it's going to be a much more hostile environment, I think, for Trump. Yeah. Because I think they're just going to want to talk about January 6th. All that said, he could be in a lot of trouble. And I, I, I thought at some point he can just coast through, but he cannot obviously stay in the basement. There is no COVID emergency the way there was four years ago. So he's going to be out there. I, so I, I do think that he's in trouble. And they're trying everything. And I'll, let me just throw one more thing at. They're trying to like, oh, we got to win the youth vote. We got to win the black vote. And, and I feel like they're already giving up on the Hispanic vote at this point. Yeah, um, and unmentioned, con- right. And th- there's constantly now talk about Virginia being a-, a dead heat. And I'm not so sure about that yet, but if it's enough for them to worry about Virginia, they cannot then divert any of their resources from Pennsylvania or Michigan because they can't lose either of those. If you lose Pennsylvania, the heat, Biden's totally toast. But if, they lose, if they're worried about losing Virginia, then, then he's really done for. So, I mean, I, at this point, looking at the polls, Arizona, I think it's they're they giving they're going to give up on Arizona, Nevada to a certain extent. I think which I mean, has been think a long time. Ne- and North North Carolina is a foregone conclusion. And Georgia, think about giving up on Nevada yeah. as yeah. a Democratic Party. Yeah. Nevada is a the the coalition that boosts Democrats there and has for a long time is diverse, huge Hispanic numbers, mm-hmm. and working class. Yeah, and to have lost that, right already for it to be something that they're going to move on from is quite a thing. Right. right. I mean, it's not like they've, thing. it's not like they've shifted operations or they've left, but I feel like because of that margin and yeah, and it's a very good point. No, just, Mary, no but the, the, the yeah. margin has been repeatedly yeah. in double consistently, digits. Consistently. So, and also it's, it, it's, it, it's good of you to point out 
that it has been reliably democratic for many election cycles because of the power of the hospitality and the right, catering yes, union. It's, the, it's well. the catering union. They come out for this. So the fact that if, 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 if Trump is up five or six points, despite all that, that, that is a bad sign. That is a bad sign. for This him. reminds me, by the way, I just want to point out for both of our edification moving forward that the Fairfax County teachers who served us yeah. so well during the pandemic, some of them were good and trusted public servants. A lot of them banded together to make sure kids stayed out of school along with school boards. They unionized officially and I believe have oh. collective bargaining as of now. Wow. So they're going to have more power than they had during the pandemic. So good luck to everyone. Yeah. Just a just a side note. Should we talk about Caitlin Clark so we can fit it in? Hey, let's do it. Finally, right. we're going to do it. <laughs> so Caitlin Clark is in the WNBA now. I believe somewhat famously Diana Taurasi, who is one of perhaps the most, is that how you say it? Yeah, that's right. One of the, the most famous the former UConn. Yeah. female Gino's. basketball player of all time said before Caitlin Clark came into the league, like, hey, you know, she's going to meet up with reality here and there's going to be oh. some growing up to do and some yeah. challenges for her. Now, I did listen to her whole quote and I don't think that her quote was like, that much of a cheap shot. I think it was more of a like, you know, this is a different level. And yeah. however, there have been plenty of cheap shots. <laughs> oh, literally. Yeah. Since Clark came into the league where right. I just saw a report this morning that I sent to you guys about the numbers that Clark is bringing in and the attention that she has put on the sport. Attendance is up 156% from last year in the WNBA. And more than half of NBA WNBA games this year have been sellouts. Uh, about 400,000 fans have attended WNBA games this season, filling arenas to 94% capacity. Televised games are averaging 1.32 million viewers, nearly triple last season's average of 462,000. WNBA NBA countdown is averaging 741,000 viewers, a 211% increase from yeah. last year. And online merchandise and all of the deals, all that stuff is sort of being distributed throughout the league yeah. but uh, yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of hard fouls on clark there are there, there are particularly that by that that player kennedy i believe yes. is her last do name. we say it kennedy or chennedy it's spelled with a ch it but is, maybe it it's is. just kennedy i'm gonna say kennedy i okay. could be wrong i could be wrong no I'm uh, there for in which it. case I... correction but yes i would also say with those numbers like 200 300 percent increases that's starting from a very low base you know, yes. I mean, still, if you compare it to the NBA, obviously it's apples and oranges, but nevertheless, she is bringing a lot of attention. I just wanted to say this quickly about hazing for rookies. In particular, the bigger the star of the rookie, I think the more the hazing happens. Right. If you've ever watched that great HBO series, Winning Time and mm -hmm. Magic Johnson having to do all this, you know, serving Kareem Abdul-Jabbar every morning, his freshly squeezed orange juice. And the newspaper, and the only newspaper that, you know, in winning time, he wanted to read was the, and, and Kareem is obviously a very smart man. So uh, he just wanted to read New York Times and Magic's bringing him the LA Times. He's like, not the right times, you know? And so it's just constantly, you have to do all these things. When I was at Georgetown, Allen Iverson had just left. A friend of mine was at the gym in the summer and saw him playing just, you know, with Patrick Ewing. Oh no, excuse me, correction. It was Lonzo Mourning and Dikembe Mutombo. And they're just practicing in the gym, just the three of them in the summer. And he had just graduated. He was going over to Philadelphia. And at the end of the practice, my friend saw this with his own eyes, where Zoe, Alonzo Mourning, throws his car keys at Allen Iverson and just says, right. go get my car. He might have said something else, but he just right. said, go get my car. And Iverson threw it back at him. He's like, I'm not doing that. But the fact is, you got to do the water. You got to get the balls. You got to do all this yeah. stuff. So hazing happens. I get it. But I think at some point you do have to draw the line about where does it end, especially with hard fouls against well, and, Caitlin and Clark. Well, and so Kennedy, I believe she's a Chicago Sky player, yes. was assessed a flagrant foul yeah. belatedly for that, which like seem, Kennedy Carter is her name, which seems about right. And then there was some blowback because this team was then at a hotel where they were asked questions by a guy with a camera about this foul oh. and they cried foul her about this treatment sort of calling it harassment and frankly i think look there are accusations of flopping 
on Caitlin Clark. I think this oh. is a bit of a, a news cycle. Well, players are very good about the, a lot of players are very yes, good at that too. This was a this was a flop in the face of a video camera and some questioning that didn't seem all that aggressive. Right. Was a about nudge. the game. You know, you guys are public figures at this point and getting all this attention. To your point, Vic, I think a lot of this is just women's basketball looking like men's basketball. Yeah. And yeah. I don't really have a problem with that. Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, who is sort of her chief rival and has been since since college, she played for LSU against Iowa. They are rivals. The competition is heated. They're both very good in their sport. Often mm. people who spend a lot of time focusing on becoming the best in their sport, they're not always the perfect role models. They're not always perfectly sportsmanlike. Right. That's just life. And yeah. I don't think that Clark should be subject to physical abuse in major ways. Right. People should get flagged for the right things. I saw another hit or another foul on her the other night, which wasn't dramatic. The foul was like the woman was coming too fast at her while she's going up for a jumper and just body checks her. But it didn't look intentional. Caitlin Clark shoots the shot. The foul is called. And then the woman who committed the foul acted like Caitlin Clark had flopped. Oh. And sort of imitated a flop. Yes. Flop. And it's like, you need to reassess who's the drama queen here because it's not actually Caitlin Clark. Right, right, right. Anyway, the point is we're all talking about this and people are spending money on it. So They, they are. They are. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see. I mean, Indiana Fever is doing terrible this year, but obviously <clears throat> the worst teams get the best players in that draft. So that's how it works. We'll yep. see how long, you know, I, I don't know how long she's uh, staying there, but that is her situation. And again, when we think about hazing and hard fouls, in drawing the line, I would, in my memory, the worst of the hard fouls in college was John Chaney, who was the legendary coach from Temple. And this was back in like 2005. He felt like he was, the, the refing was bad. So he sent in a player to rough up one of the other players. I think it was St. Joe's, the other team. And to the point where it was such a hard foul, the other player from St. Joe's fractured his arm. Oh no! Like, uh, broke it up, and then as a result, Chaney got sus he self suspended and so because even he knew. Wait, I might have got a little too far, but he said, "I mean, I, I think I think uh, Chaney's line was send in the goons." Oh my gosh! So you know what? Let's. But again, we can go too far, and I know this would drive you crazy, Mary Catherine, which is the Indiana Congressman Jim Banks. He sent a letter to the WNBA saying, "Ah, you know, hey, what's going? I want an investigation. What's going on here with this heart foul?" You know what? My my take is let them play. Let, let them play. play. I agree. And may I tell one quick story before we Please. let you go and close this out? Yeah. Uh, which is that when I was a middle school basketball player, which I was. What was your position? All, what were you? What did I, you play? I, I just was all over the place. <laughs> and uh, they don't really have you positions. You were at the top of the key. Okay. In middle school women's yeah. basketball, there's not. I was, I was not shooting a Shooting guard. I was, I was a basically a shooting guard. I wasn't uh -huh. a point guard. My okay. ball handling all skills right. were not that good. But I could shoot okay. Uh -huh. And really, as with all chicks like me, I played defense. <laughs> And I played a lot of defense. Played safe. And at one game at a rough middle school that had, I kid you not, in the dressing room, bare light bulbs hanging from the ceiling, I there was a woman we called Michelle Jordan, who was our opponent. You see how oh, yeah. see what we did there? Instead of Michael, um, yeah, I got she that. She was very tall. She was very big. She was very skilled. But she was not disciplined enough to uh, drive the lane without fouling people. So my coach asked me, who's... My only athletic skill, basically, is that I'm I'm fast. And I'm, I was little and fast. And he said, MK, you need to run down the court and take the charge. And I was like, wow. I was like, Look from her? She's like twice my size. And I yeah. don't mean that in an offensive way. She's uh -huh. just a, she was a grown woman. Yeah. And I'm like 83 pounds soaking wet. And he's like, take the charge. So I go down the court. And like four times, I just stood in front of her. Did you plant your feet? Yep. Good. Because I I could get down the you court before her, yeah. and then I would plant my yeah. feet and get yeah. That's it. flat then on my back. It. That's right. And I, get the foul. and I got to tell you, the home team and its fans uh, in the bare light bulb school, not friendly to that move. <laughs> not friendly. Not friendly when she fouled out of the game because oh, I had stood Mary before her Catherine. with my feet planted. Look at you. Yeah. That was my Caitlin Clark moment, guys. Send in the goons. Except without yeah. any of the scoring. Okay. All right. <laughs> You know what we're not talking about really quickly on this What's show up? is going to be the Hunter Biden verdict because I think it's going to happen as the listeners are are, are, are tuning in. So I'm imagining because they're already deliberations, but come our next episode, we'll probably have, I'm assuming well, they'll come to a decision. Once again, we are queuing the no, news to break. We're setting it up. Okay. Yeah, we're queuing the news to break and you'll hear more about it this week. All right. Shall we close it down for today? Because Vic's got 
He's got uh, a meeting. Lots going on. I got to get on the road. You're on the and, road. And we'll bring you more. We will have week. more on the next episode. That wraps up this episode of Getting Hammered. Remember, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. And you can follow me on Twitter at Victorino Mattis, not at Vic Mattis. Hugh Hewitt has done this. And poor at Vic Mattis. Sorry, Vic. He had yeah. to, he locked his account. It's too Aww. much. It's too crazy. So apologies to him. It's at Victorino. Okay, I'm at MK Hammer on Twitter, at MK Hammer Time on Instagram. You can follow the show at Getting Hammer Podcast on YouTube and Instagram and watch us there. Thanks for getting hammered responsibly and responsibly take those charges out there, everybody. Don't be flagrant. All right, this has been a Nebulous Media Podcast. Thank you.